Well, I think I'm on port part four, and we've been going through Romans chapter eight. We're up to verse ten. It's been exciting, man. Talk about unveiling, uh, revealing what's there, what Paul was seeing, his uh, revelation from the Lord, and it's really powerful. So um, I don't know if I've heard much of this from pulpits, but it's all there in the text as we've been going through. However, so you're going to want to watch the last videos and you know, bring us up to this point. However, he says, again, he's using this word day. Uh, it can mean various things. And now I'm going to talk to you moreover and however. If Christ, he's defining who are Christians because they're the ones that have no condemnation. And he's not defining special classes of Christians like I've heard people say. Man, I believe where they get that. But it doesn't say that he's not talking about different classes of Christians like, oh, super spiritual, they never sin type thing. Well, that's in violation of 1 John. So if, however, Christ is in you, okay, and he, he, that's from the, he's always building on the last sentence. And then he builds on the last sentence. So. He's talking about those who have Christ dwelling within the Spirit of God, which is the Spirit of Christ, right there in verse 9, dwelling permanently as residents, taking up residence in you. They're the ones that are he's talking to that have the Spirit of God, that are in the Spirit. And that means by the means of the Spirit. They are living, they are living and existing by the means of the Spirit. They are walking by the Spirit, but they are, he's talking really in the Spirit. They are existing, because he uses the word being. He's got all the way down from uh, this idea of doing, working, living, in, uh, walking all through the world. You know, it's works. You're working. You're, you're, you're doing. You're moving through life. All the way down to being, because being is what creates, is the problem. Where, where are you being? And he's talking about those who are in the world, those who are not in Christ, those who are still under condemnation, that because they are actually in hostility with God. They are punching God right in the face, literally. And they're being in the flesh. But you are absolutely not <laughs> being in the spirit. Uh, being in the flesh because you are being in the spirit and he says well I want to define who those are because there's a lot of people that go to church <laughs> just like there was a lot of people following Paul that were not absolutely not uh, those who are no longer under condemnation they were under condemnation they were trying to buy the power of the Holy Spirit remember the magician Simon uh, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells permanently in you. So th this is the Holy Spirit of God has to dwell in you personally as permanent residence if you are going to be defined as being presently ongoing de de ongoingly defined as those who are in the Spirit, by the means of the Spirit. You are by the means. Your identity is now by the means of the Spirit. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, and then he says, if, however, the Spirit of Christ does not, uh, you do not hold on or possess the Spirit of Christ, right? It's not in you. You're not holding on or possessing it. Then you are absolutely, in fact, not of him. That means he does not possess you. You don't belong to him. And this is defined as, exists as, of him. You do not, in fact, exist uh, you are not defined or exist um, as of him, as of him. You, in other words, you're not his. You do not presently or ongoingly exist as his. Now we're finally in verse 10, so we kind of see if, however, Christ is in you. Now that is is implied from the previous verse. If Christ in you. You don't have to keep resupplying the verb. It's, it's different in English, right? It's really choppy. 
if the Spirit of Christ dwells within you, right, and you are in Him, you are possessed by Him, he, you belong to Him, then, so it's an if, then kind of statement. Indeed, there's that word meaning uh, I'm going to affirm or uh, truly, verily, indeed, he's building this argument, the body, now, what body is he talking about? The body, dead. The body, dead. Dead, it's dead. All right, so what body is he talking? 4983, Soma. So we can go look, cl click on Soma, and then click down on the right-hand column, all the way down. This is Bible, uh, Bible Hub, interlinear, on that verse. And now we're going all the way down to the left. I'm looking for Romans. And we are all the way into verse 10. The body is dead. But he'd already talked about the body in... 724 and 74, uh, but particularly 724. So you, we say, well, let's go look at 724. So Romans chapter, I'm going to go back over to Bible Gateway, English Standard Version. It's the formal equivalence for doctrine. It's not perfect, as we've seen. The Greek, the Greek has so much more. Uh, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? That was his original question that he asked. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This body. He's talking about his fleshly members. Sin dwells in my members. And he's talking about his body. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God. It's God the Father through the realizing channel of Jesus Christ. Our Lord, our Master. Now he's talking about our Christians. And that's why in verse uh, 8, 1, chapter 8, verse 1, he's talking about us, like himself, like in this situation, who's going to deliver us, snatch us up to be with himself, that's going to take us away from this body of death. And he says, thanks be to God, it is through Jesus Christ. We know that happens at our glorification, at the end of our Christian walk. But he's talking about our Christian walk now. And this body is our the body of sin we know that was killed in, uh, in order that the body of sin might be Romans chapter 6. Right? He's talking about water baptism and how our body... Of sin, the body of sin, our mortal body, you know, that's what it's talking about. Our mortal body where sin dwells in our flesh. So it's the mortal body, it's not the body of Christ. So let's get back out of there. So we know what he's talking about, this body, this body, this flesh, because we got to remember his last statement says, I myself presently and ongoingly this is his summation of this battle between the flesh and his identity, which is the Spirit of Christ dwelling within him. I myself serve the principle or law of God. And this is Mosaic law. He says the Mosaic law with my mind, because he's a Jewish Christian. With my mind, right? In, I, my inward being is saying, I, this is how I am a slave. I serve as a slave, presently and ongoingly. But the problem is, with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. There is this principle of sin that dwells in my bodily members, and I, presently and ongoingly, am serving as a slave. There is two, there's a battle going on between who I serve as a slave. And he's saying it's an ongoing battle. But we're going to be delivered completely. He talks about change, being changed into his likeness and finally being delivered from this mortal body. He keeps talking about this mortal body. So he says, if you are in Christ, right, if you're one of the Christians I'm talking to, 
right, instead of one of the people in the world, because this letter is going to everybody. The in, indeed, the body, this body, is dead on account of sin. This body of death, he calls it the body of death. It is a body of death. And he says, it is presently and ongoingly something I'm slave to. And it is dead. It is dead. Literally, it means lax life. Uh, unable to respond to impulses or perform perfunction, perform functions. Inoperative to the things of God. You see, it's not physically dead because he's still living in it. But it is inoperative. It is dead to God, to, to the things of the Spirit. That's why he says the, the man that is completely in the flesh, he is unable to please God. And this body, he's saying, by the way, this body, it's unable to please God. This body in the flesh, this it's, it's dead. It's, it is dead to God. It is, it is, you know, cut off on account of sin, it through the realizing dia di, diameter. Why is it dead? Through the realizing, what made it dead? Through the realizing channel, through the circle diameter, through the realizing channel of sin. So sin is what made it dead. Sin is what made this body of death dead. It's called the body of sin, the body of death. Where have we seen that? We've seen that a lot. Body of sin death okay it's not used both it's either the body of sin or the body of death and oh my gosh there's seven places uh let's see the body yeah we know that our old self that's old identity the man in the flesh is unable to please god will not submit to the law of god it says uh, Romans chapter 6 about water baptism. We know that our old self was crucified with him, with him, Christ, in order that the body of sin might be rendered inoperative. Might be rendered inoperative. Didn't say killed, because here we are, we're still in the flesh. It might be rendered inoperative. The batteries of this body of sin the batteries is the old man. The old man died, was crucified with Christ, because the old man was the batteries that operated this body of sin, might be rendered inoperative, so that we no longer would be enslaved to sin. Because it just said, you're going to be a slave to sin, period. That old man just said, you're going to be a slave to sin. He says in 8, uh, 8.10, but if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. The body is dead. It's rendered in, uh, dead means just lifeless. And, and it is. It's dead to God. It's not completely dead physically. And it still has its passions and desires. Right? It still has its passions and desires. But it's dead because of sin. Sin is ruining. Sin has made it completely uh, ineffective to God. The bot, This body is ineffective to God. It's unable, ineffective, dead, powerless, unresponsive to God. This, this body is not going to obey God. That's why Paul says, it's, 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 I'm still presently, ongoingly, a slave to the power of sin that's in this body. However, he says, Here's that worst day, day, but he just keeps saying, but, but, but. However, the Spirit is life. And he already said the Spirit is life. Zoe life and peace. And he said that Spirit, life, and peace. He said that back in Romans 8, verse 6. But if you're dwelling, if you're dwelling on the things of the Spirit within you, in your mind, and that flushes itself out, it is genuine life in spirit. Well, here he's saying it again in verse 10, but the Spirit of God is genuine life. He doesn't have to say is again. 
just like he didn't have to say the body is dead. It's just implied on account through the realizing channel of righteousness. So it is genuine life. The spirit is genuine life within us because uh, of righteousness, and it's the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ, right, came into us, propitiation, through the transference of, of Christ. Wow, right? When the Holy Spirit comes in, the Holy Spirit is righteous. Righteous means right with God and uh, pure, just, um, divine righteousness. It's, it's the quality of God. It's God is holy and righteous. And that came in to us. And that's how it brings genuine life. Genuine life, you see, the body is dead, is what he's saying. The body is dead to God, right? It's inoperative, I mean, it's, it's unresponsive to God. The body is. But the spirit, right, the spirit that's coming into a Christian, that is genuine life because of righteousness, on account of righteousness, through the realizing channel of righteousness, and that righteousness is Christ. <clears throat> That's what made, makes us genuinely live. And here he goes. Here's that day again. If now the spirit of the one, and that one is Christ, the spirit of the one, uh, having raised up the one is, is God, the spirit of God, the one, because he just talked about God. Yep. Now, if the spirit of, of the one, right, having raised up Jesus, when did he raise up Jesus? God, the, right? Jesus was raised by the spirit of God. We, we see that all, all over the place. Just look up uh, raise spirit, and you'll see that if uh, it is, yeah, he, he who raised Christ from the dead, God did, Father, will give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. And 1 Corinthians 15 says, 15, 44, it's talking about raised a spiritual body. And if there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it's talking about that. But he's Paul's talking about the, the blessed hope. Where is the blessed hope? Blessed hope. It's called the Blessed Hope. Paul talks about our resurrection. There's a lot of places. And waiting for our Blessed Hope, the appearing uh, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that is what we're waiting for, the Blessed Hope. And we're living in this present age. And we're changed into his likeness. Where is that set? And we are, we are transformed or we're changed into his likeness. I'm going to go do what I've done before I go out to, not Google, duck, duck, go it. Uh, changed into his likeness verse. And we'll just say verse Colossians 3 Bible verses about changed into his likeness at our resurrection. It has to do with resurrection. Okay, so let's look at resurrection twinkling. Nope. So again, sometimes you can't find it in English. Um, resurrection twinkle verse, twinkling of an eye. 
numbers. Yes, 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Wow. 1552. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in disown, dishonor, yes, this body of sin, and, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. We are going to be just like the Lord. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Uh, so... The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. And was the, as was the man of dust, so also those are who are of the dust. And as is of the man of heaven, so are also those who are of heaven. Just as we you, you have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Not everybody is going to die. But we shall all be changed. In a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Yeah, we're going to be changed. <laughs> we are going to be changed. Wow, I wonder what that says in the Greek. Let's see what that says. 1 Corinthians 15.52 Let's type that in. 1 Corinthians 15.52 1 Corinthians 15.52 I'm putting that in the, inter, in the Bible hub. 1 Corinthians 15.52 Something happened. 1 Corinthians 15.52 There you turn. And it says, We shall be changed. Alasso. We will be altered, transformed, exchanged from one thing to another. Wow. Praise the Lord. We're going to be changed from one thing to another. We're going to be going from this body to Christ's body. So this body is going to be history. He says, now, if the spirit of the one, back to Romans 8 and 11, has already, past tense, Raised up Jesus out from the dead. Right? That spirit, that spirit that raised Jesus out from the dead in the past presently and ongoingly dwells. And he already told us that's a true Christian. If the spirit of Christ dwells in you, then you are in the spirit. Where do you say that? said that probably on the previous video. Yeah, verse 9. But if you are in the Spirit, that is, if the Spirit of God presently, ongoingly dwells as permanent residence in you, <laughs> that's who he's talking about. He says, if it dwells in you, if the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead presently, ongoingly dwells permanently in you like a house, the one, that spirit, he doesn't have to repeat spirit, because you can just say the one, using the definite article, having already done this, raising up from out of the dead, Christ Jesus, he repeats it actually, he wants to really get this clear, He's this is the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, will in the future. Now he doesn't say presently and ongoingly, he uses the future, he introduces Something you would never see in the Greek, um, in the English. <laughs> he will give life. That is that genuine life. Zoe. But this is poi zoe. You know, so we'll make alive. We'll make genuinely alive. 
right? Third person singular, he, she, or it. This is the one, the one. He, she, or it will give you life. It's, it's talking about the spirit. Also, to the mortal bodies of you. Kai is sometimes used here not as a conjunction and coupled to this or and related to this but it is to the mortal bodies of you right so it is sort of related he says and kind of related to this uh, will give you life also like it did to Jesus but in this case to the mortal bodies of you it will give life to the mortal bodies of you even though it is dead right? The, our mortal bodies are dead, just like Christ's mortal body went into death, right? It went into death. Our mortal bodies are dead. And it says, also, they're dead, right? Our mortal bodies are dead. That means they cannot respond to, to, to God. They are, they are just out of relationship with God. But he's going to give life, genuine life, to the mortal bodies of you. Why is this going to happen? Why do we get our resurrected, changed into his likeness? Why are we going to be made like Christ? Because the same spirit, it says, because of his spirit dwelling routinely. Now this is a participle routinely lifestyle as a habit it's routinely dwelling there's that word dwell again but it's dwelling in so it's it's added the preposition in is dwelling in you and he says the indwelling right it's like he say he used the preposition in twice he used it twice the his spirit on account of the spirit of him, right? The spirit of him, Christ, right? Jesus, dwelling, it's dwelling in, because it's in, the preposition in, in oiki, meaning dwelling is personal residence, in, and then he says it, in you. <laughs> so I don't know whether this was, Paul was trying to really emphasize, or he just, um, he just doesn't know Greek very well, or if he's trying to really emphasize in you, <laughs> because of, of his dwelling Holy Spirit dwelling in you. His indwelling Holy Spirit. No, it's not even used as an adjective. It's a verb. So he could have said his indwelling Holy Spirit is in you. But he said because of his spirit, uh, not because, but through the realizing channel. So this is why what's going to give us life, genuine life to our immortal bodies, it's talking about the resurrection uh, that's coming. Dwelling in us, dwelling within us, permanently residing within us. And it says, in you. That's verse 11. So then, brothers, now we're getting into, well, this is all theology, right? This is just statement of fact. Who are Christians? Who are those who are no longer under condemnation? So then, brethren, that's brothers and sisters, we presently, that's plural, yeah, first person plural, we, including himself, presently and ongoingly are, right, debtors. We are, we exist, we are defined, we are Christians, not condemned. But we are in, he said, the Spirit is dwelling within us, right? And that's why we're going to be resurrected. Brethren, we are, so he, he says, therefore, you know, why is it therefore? Therefore, since all this is true, he's, he said all these factual things about us. And all this promise that we're going to be resurrected. So therefore, brother, we are debtors. We are debtors. He says, we presently ongoingly are debtors. And what does that word mean? It means we are, on, are under obligation to pay back a debt. We are indebted. We are indebted. 
we are indebted. We, he's going to raise us up to be with Christ. Right? We have no condemnation, verse 1. We are not going to be condemned. We are not going to be sentenced to death. Guilty. He says, we are debtors. All right? Absolutely not, in fact, to the flesh. All right? Slave, right? The slavery of sin, that's, it's coming down from the flesh. Remember, the actions come down from the dictates of the flesh as if there's someone ordering us. We saw that use of the word kata, down from the flesh. You are not down. He says, absolutely not, in fact, to the flesh. Yeah, we are debtors, not, absolutely not, in fact, to the flesh. We are. He's stating an absolute reality here. All right? And then he says, well, then what? What to? <laughs> According to the flesh to live. We are debtors not to take the dictates of the flesh, but down from, there's that word kata, according, not, oh, oh, so now he's defining, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Not, absolutely not, according to the flesh, right? That's what he's saying, to live. Not to the flesh, we are Brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh. That's what he's really saying. We are debtors, not to the flesh. What do you mean, not to the flesh? That's people, he's, he's thinking ahead. How are they going to object? Is he, wow, do they understand what I'm talking about? So he, again, explains himself. The one's living, the one, singular, living down from the flesh, Right? That's what he's talking about. We are not to the flesh, not down from the flesh. He's, re he's defining what he means by we are debtors not to the flesh. We are debtors not to live according to the flesh. He could have just said that, but he, this is Paul. He's very wordy. Paul's very wordy. And this, is, again, is president ongoingly to live. We are not to live according to the flesh. We are not to live. We are not to Zoe live according to the flesh. We cannot find genuine life living. <coughs> he says now, verse 13, why, why is this? Why are we not in debtors? So he uses that word gar again. For this is the reason, this is the reason, if you all second person plural, if you all presently and ongoingly generally try to live, right, according or down from the dictates of the flesh, right, the flesh is telling you what to do, you presently, y'all presently are about to die. All right, you are about mellow. Uh, you're, you, this is going to continue. You're heading towards death, basically. You're at a very point of, you're ready. You're at the very point of acting. You're, it's about to happen. It's generally is what's sure to happen. So surely, is, is see, you're going to die. Presently and ongoingly, you're going to exper experience this word die, to die. What is this? Patho Nesco, to die away, off, away from, focusing on the separation that goes on with dying away from. So, dying, we're going to be separated from life, which is God. And so, if you, he's saying, for if you live down from the flesh, and who are they? They're not those who are in the flesh. I'm sorry, they're not those who are in the spirit. They are in the flesh. That, that's, they're just... This is almost like natural man, right? Always in the flesh. They cannot please God. They're in hostility to God. He says, you are about to die. But he, and he's saying, y'all, y'all, whoever this is, y'all, that are going to live down from the flesh, you are about to die. In other words, it, you're, you're fastly approaching death. If 
how, now he's talking about the other group. If, however, by the means of the Spirit, there is there it is, date of case of Spirit, by the means of the Spirit, the deeds, the deeds, the functions, the word praxis, of the body, we already know it's the body of sin, right? And praxis means functions, implying sustained activity or responsibility. So the sustained activities of the body, by the means of the Spirit, you put to death, plural. He's talking to all, whoever wants to hear this. Put to death, presently and ongoingly, that means to subdue, to uh, make dead, liberate from the bond of, destroy, render ex extinct, to put to death. Yeah. So it's very weird how he's playing with words here. If you're in the flesh, if you're in the flesh, if you're not a Christian, if you live for the dictates of your flesh, you are fastly approaching death. You will, you will absolutely die. But if by the means of the Spirit, right, on the other hand, if by the means of the Spirit, right, by the means of the Spirit, it's not by your religious desire, but by the means of the Spirit, you put to death the misdeeds, the deeds, the functions, right, the functions functions of the body, the business, the sustained activities of the body. And we know it's the body of sin that he's talking. Not just your, oh, like, oh, I'm going to put together the ability of my arm. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the body that is committing sin. So it's, words are always defined by context. So he's not talking, oh, I want you to cut off your arm, you know, so you can no longer do this, lift up things so you can eat, you know, and take care of yourself. No, nope, can't do it. He's talking about the misdeeds, the deeds, the functions, the sustained activities of this body of sin, right? It's the same word he's used before. If you put to death, that it literally means put it to death. Put, you know, knock it out. Then, it's an if-then type thing. Sometime in the future, you will actually live. So you got to do one thing in order to experience another thing. That's what he's saying. Presently and ongoingly, you put this to death. Then you will live. But we know in context, it's talking about genuinely, genuinely living. It's the same thing he's been talking about all along, genuine living. And he's talking about not just by and by in the sky, you know. I think it's talking about here in life, here on earth. For, now he's explaining again, why am I saying this? For this reason, as many as, as many as, as many as, plural, those, right, who are presently, actually, being led, it's passive, being led by the Spirit of God. By the Spirit of God, right? Ago, being led, means, yeah, lead, lead away, leading away from sin, leading away from uh, our body of sin that's bringing death, to drive or driving us, you know, also could be he's driving us, but he's actually leading us because the shepherd's in front of the sheep. So not behind us, pushing, try to push a cow. <laughs> Good luck. Pushing sheep, that doesn't work. Unless you're a barking dog at their heels. Uh, so you're being urged on by impulse. So that's what it's talking about. Those who are presently, ongoingly, being led, it's passive, like a shepherd, a sheep, by the Spirit of God, 
these ones, these ones, are presently ongoingly defined as, exist as, defined as, sons of God. Now, is this just children or who? Kyrios. I've heard, well, we are all children of God, but the ones that are being led by the Spirit, very interesting, he says, these are sons of God, Kyrios. Kyrios is properly a son by birth or adoption. You could say we're all sons. But it says anyone sharing the same nature as their father. Okay, so we have the same nature of the Spirit of God living in us. So we could say we're all sons. Uh, we are becoming a son of God begins with being reborn, adopted by the Heavenly Father through Christ, which is the work of the Eternal Son. And it can, re, it can actually refer to female believers, Galatians 3.28. It emphasizes the likeness to the believer, uh, of the believer to the Heavenly Father, resembling his character more and more through the process of living by faith. Huh. Highlights the legal right to the Father's inheritance. Now, this is very interesting. As the believer lives in conformity to the Father's nature. You know, Paul talks a lot about how you don't receive your inheritance until you're a curios. So you have to reach, reach the age of maturity. And that happens after you get out of being a little child you know, with all your problems and now you're a mature adult that you are your father can trust you with an inheritance and so <clears throat> I think a lot of people have rightly noted that this is referring to uh, a different class of Christians that are now being led they're actually being led by the spirit now he's going deeper he's going beyond just Christians that are in Christ is talking about those who are being led by the Spirit. For if the inheritance, uh, no, he's not talking about that, cast out the slave woman, shall not hear in the king. Um, hmm, where did I see that? The son received their inheritance. The Hirios receives their the women women shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Huh. Where did I see that? Alright, so this is where we go back to duck duck go. Um, inheritance goes to mature sons. It's mature sons. Uh, otherwise you're a slave. Yeah, it says verse. There's a verse that says, well, until you are a mature son, you're treated like a child. Galatians 4.1. You're going to be treated like, which is no different than the other servants or slaves in the house. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. Galatians 4.1. And so, he continues, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. That's where we get pedagogists, is these people who are hired servants to make sure the kid went to school. And he's saying that the law is like this. In the same way, also, when we were children, implying when we were children as uh, Jews, we had not, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world, Stokian. These are rules that say don't touch, don't, don't do, don't. These are commandments that are common in all religions. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth the Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as hues, as sons. So we're adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son, right? And if a son, 
than an heir through God. I think what Paul is saying, if we look at all that Paul says about this, is that Jews, until they received Christ, they were like children being just, don't do this, don't do this, you know, basically protected and guarded. And the law was like that. It was uh, teaching them to keep them, you know, don't touch that, don't touch this. And these are all elemental, very rudimental ABCs, the way you teach little kids. You don't explain a lot. You just tell them what to do. And that's what the Old Testament law was like until they become adopted sons. So maybe this is not a special class. I think this is referring back to you are no longer in condemnation, verse 1. And he's talking about you are in the Spirit because the Spirit of God has per taken permanent residence in you. And so you are... In, you are defined as being in the spirit, not in the flesh. He says you're absolutely not in the flesh because the spirit of God dwells in you. So this is not talking about, oh, you can have carnal Christians. <laughs> you can have fleshly Christians. He said, no, actually, if you're living in the flesh and the spirit of God is not leading you, then you're not a Christian. You can say whatever you want to say. As many as, for as many as the spirit of God is led, is leading that doesn't mean he's got them there. It means he's getting them there. Do you understand? Presently and ongoingly, we haven't arrived. Arriving is when we are changed into his likeness. We are raised from the dead. He gives life to our mortal bodies. That's the promise. That's the blessed hope. But he's going to get us there, meanwhile. And we are being led there. And this is a process. You know, this is not an event. This is presently and ongoingly leading us. Right? The Spirit of God is working on us. He's in us. We are following Him. Then we are these sons of God. That's who we are. We are these sons of God. All right. So, and how is He going to define this? For absolutely not. He's defining this again. He's always defining what He just said. For absolutely, I can say this because absolutely in fact... You have not received, you have not received, you, you all, these Christians he's talking that are no longer under condemnation, you have not received, lombano means grabbed for yourself. You have not grabbed a hold of for yourself. This is not passive, it's active. You have not grabbed a hold of for yourself. A spirit, just any old spirit, it doesn't have the definite article, of Bondage or slavery again, 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 what do you mean again? That's that's really important because he put that again. To or reaching or penetrating fear all the way to fear. Well, fear of what? <laughs> fear of judgment and condemnation, sentencing. You are damned. And where did they get that, that fear? These were Christians. I'm sorry, these were Jews. He says, you have not, These are. he's talking to Jews, again to fear. Where did they get this original bondage, slavery to fear? Wow, slavery to fear because of the judgment that's coming. You know, without Christ, there is a fear of judgment. And we can just type in fear of judgment, and there's plenty out there. And the fear of judgment... There's a lot in the Old Testament, obviously. And uh, in Hebrews 10, 27, it says, Without the sacrifice of Christ, you, all you have left is a fearful expectation of judgment. That's what it is. And a fury of fire that consumes the adversaries of God. Uh, wow. Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of judgment has come. Wow. It is a fearful, terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. What is the context of Hebrews 10.27? The context is that these Jews were ready to go back to Moses and just abandon Christ and profane the death of Christ. Treat as common uh, is what profane means, the death of Christ. And this is the deliberate sin. They were deliberately uh, sinning. They were, they were going to treat Christ as a common criminal, go back to Moses. 
It says, if we have deliberately sinned after we have received the knowledge of the truth is Christ. The knowledge, the intimate knowledge of Christ. There is absolutely, in fact, no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Yeah, because Christ was the sacrifice for sins. And if you say he was just a criminal and you go back to Moses trying to be uh, uh, righteous through obedience to the law, then you're done. It says, there's nothing left but a fearful expectation of judgment. Fearful expectation of judgment. And that is being a slave to a slave to fear. And I'll just look up slave to fear. And in the New Testament, it says, for you did, yeah, we are looking at eight. It says, and those, and deliver all those who through fear of death were brought uh, into slavery or subject to lifelong slavery. Hebrews 2.15. That's what Christ did. To deliver all those who through fear of death, we are absolutely fearful of death because you're just going to face judgment. And we are subject to lifelong slavery. We're a slave to the fear of death. He says, but you, in Romans 8, 15, absolutely not in fact have you received a spirit. That's demonic, isn't it? A spirit that is again a slavery again to fear. So they should have been delivered from this fear if you're a Christian. But you have actually in the past he's talking you've all this has already happened to you christians you have received the spirit of divine adoption as sons that's that huios again a, do, a divine adoption as sons a son into divine family sonship legally made a son worthy of an inheritance the inheritance is is what came through the son of god by whom we cry. We presently, ongoingly cry. Crazo. We, we shriek. We cry out aloud from deep emotion. Deep emotion. This is deep emotion. Abba, Father. So we have a new relationship with God. Beloved Father. Abba means Daddy. It's a beloved, a tender endearment by a beloved child, affectionate, dependent relationship with their daddy, their papa. So we have, we've, I, I, I have felt it. I felt the love of God, and it just, I feel now, man, it just chokes me up. It, it's just like you're my child, you're my, you know, and I'm, and he's my daddy, he's my papa, right? And this is a term of endearment, not a formal title of God, but this is Father, the originator. So it's Abba, Father. Father means originator, originator of us. We are now adopted sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We can feel the Holy Spirit. If you cannot feel the Holy Spirit well up within you, <laughs> then you don't have the Holy Spirit. I mean, you feel this, by whom we cry from deep emotion. No kidding, I have cried so full of joy when His Holy Spirit is flowing, right? And it says, how do you know you're a Christian? The Spirit Himself, right? Itself. He, she, or it, you can say itself, really, because Numa is is it is neuter bears witness presently and ongoingly bears witness uh, that's where we get martyr bears witness together with that's the big word together with the spirit of us <laughs> the spirit of us is the holy spirit Right? The spirit, it's so funny, but he's talking about the spirit that belongs to us. You know, everyone has a spirit that keeps them alive. That's what gives you life. It's the breath, the breath, the, the breath of God. That, what is this bear, what does it bear witness? The spirit of God within us, right? Within Christians, true Christians. 
uh, bears witness in our human spirit that we presently, ongoingly are children, and that word of God, even though he says we're adopted as son, he says now we are technon. Technon is a child living in full dependence on the father, their parents. Uh, wow. A child living in willing dependence. And this is really something. Dependence. Drawing guidance from our Father. It's an attitude of heart. So, children, regardless of sex, it says, offspring, it's a general term. Other places it uses a term for little child, like before reading age. But technon, we are children of God. So we know we are sons, right? He said that. We were adopted as sons. And we are children of God. Now, Paul didn't say we know this because I just told you this. Or you read it somewhere in a book. I think a lot of Christians think, uh, the, I, Jesus loves me this I know because the Bible tells me so. No, it doesn't say that at all. The Bible doesn't, you know, it, yeah, the Bible tells us this. But you should not know this by just head knowledge, theology, because the Bible tells you so. If you have not felt this, bears witness with our spirit, our inward being. This is not head knowledge. This is inward being stuff. That we are children of God. That's why we cry out. The term, the, the, that's why we cry out. Abba, Father. This is deep emotion. That's why. Verse 16. And then he goes on to give us really even more. If now children, we are heirs. Yes, as sons we are heirs. Heirs indeed of God. We are heirs indeed of God. Joint heirs now. Okay. In fact, indeed, joint heirs of Christ. Same things. Right? If indeed, yeah, we are. We are. He says, if indeed we suffer with him. When did that happen? Romans chapter 6. He already said, you suffered with him in baptism. You died. You died with Christ on the cross. And then you were buried with Christ in the grave. It says, we have suffered presently and ongoingly. So it's not just past tense. It's current. So he's not just talking about Romans. It starts in Romans chapter 6. But we are to suffer with him. And it literally means to suffer together with, to uh, sympathize in the like manner, to feel pain together, to suffer evils together. So, so it started back then. It's got to continue. In order that we may also be glorified together with him. So now Paul's bringing in this idea of suffering. What is the suffering? Maybe we should look at that in part five. Wow. So that we may be glorified together. Now he's bringing in this idea of being glorified together. Well, I've already introduced what that is. It's when we're delivered from our body of death, finally delivered from our body of death. When we're changed in his glory, changed in his glory, from glory, change, glory. I'm going to type that in Bible Gateway. And we didn't see, uh, maybe changed in his glory. Let me go up to DuckDuckGo. Changed into his glory verse from glory to glory well we're transformed into his likeness from glory to glory as we behold him Galatians uh, I'm sorry 2nd Corinthians 3 18 but we are finally completely changed into his glory glory our glorification that's it our glorification Ah, not finding it. Glorification. Eh, didn't find glorification. 
glorify. How about just glorify? Ah, plenty in there. And I think it's, let's see if it's in Romans. Yeah, see, those, there's a process. Those who he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified. That's made righteous. And then he also glorified uh, Romans 8.30. So that's the future. And Galatians says, uh, no, that's not what I want to do. Maybe 2 Thessalonians. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints, and in the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you according to the grace. So, um, wow. I know it's in there, guys. Maybe you can find it. So there's a, a glorified. The glory of, ah, the glory. The glory. The glory. I think in Romans, he's already talked about the glory. Yes. We, in well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality. There you go. He will give eternal life. Uh, glory and honor and peace for everyone, all right? Comes through Jesus Christ, and he says, Rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is what we're doing. Through faith, through him, faith in his grace that we stand, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So, that not compared to the glory that is going to be revealed to us, to obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And so this is talking about a future glory. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about future glory. All right, so I think we're going to, this is a long one. So we better, we're going to be glorified together, it says. And it's coming. And I rec for that reason, he's saying, for that is not comparable to the sufferings. Here's the sufferings that they're going through of the present age uh, to, the, to the coming glory that is going to be revealed. It's a coming glory that is going to be revealed to us it's going to reach us it's going to penetrate us it's going to make contact with us special word ice so so they're going to go through a lot of sufferings and uh for the earnest expectation of creation is earnestly expecting this right what expecting what the revelation of the sons of god it's a waiting for the revelation the unveiling of the sons of God. We're going to be revealed to all creation. And that's what they're earnest. It's all of creation is earnestly expecting this. It's groaning, some people say. It has an inner expectation waiting for us to be revealed. Yes, for the futility of, uh, for the creation was subjected to futility. This is not willingly, uh, in fact, not willingly. But because they were subjected by the one God in hope. See, our blessed hope is what's coming up. That the creation will also be set free from the bondage of decay. That's what our body, our body's decaying. And all of creation is waiting for the same thing. Waiting to get to this freedom of the glory of the children of God. There he goes. I was looking for it. 821. They're waiting for this freedom, this being set free from the slavery. And this happens at the glory of the children of God, the glorification of the children of God. This is like the glory of God stuff. That's what it says. For all of creation groans together and travails, suffers. It's suffering until now, right? It's suffering. It's still suffering. But we are the first fruits, Christians, are the first fruits of the Spirit, uh, having, because we have the Spirit. We also, ourselves, are groaning. You know, we're suffering in this, this, this body of death. Oh, wretched man that I am. Suffering, awaiting the divine adoption of sons, which is the redemption 
of the body of us. You see, we haven't got it yet. Paul says we haven't got it yet. But we're waiting for the redemption. The redemption, buying it back, the full freedom of this body, this body of sin that he says, oh, wretched man, I'm living in. <clears throat> so we're waiting for it. This is the hope we are saved for. It's not something we see, he says. It's absolutely not what we see, but it is what we hope for. We don't see it right now. We hope with patience. I'm just paraphrasing. We hope now, we await this with great patience, enduring suffering patience. It's called enduring suffering. It's long suffering. And likewise, the Spirit now joins to help us presently and ongoingly in the weakness of us. So that's what the Holy Spirit's for, our feebleness, our weakness of the flesh, right? It's there to help us. For the things we pray for, we can't even pray for it. It behooves us. We don't even know how to pray, he says. The Spirit makes intercession sessions with groanings. Groanings. Tongues can be like this, too. There's a whole thing on inexpressible, even inexpressible. The tongues can be the Spirit interceding for us. But even in inexpressible groanings, like so deep you can't even express yourself, all right? You can't even find words for it. Like creation is groaning. And so that's the Spirit of God that is searching us and knows our hearts, searches the hearts, and is interceding us for us, according to God, for all the saints. Praise the Lord. So let's look at an, another video more about how to walk by the Spirit. And... So we know that God loves us, knows who are loving God, right? We are the ones loving God, habitually loving God. He says, God works all things together for their good. Agathos is like God-like good. It takes 17 words just to describe it. God-like good. This is not even just beautiful good. This is off the charts good. And these are the ones that are living according, down from, the purpose of, uh, his purpose, God's purpose for their being. That's what they are being, right? According to his purpose. Wow. And so he's just really defined who a Christian is. No special classes of Christian. There's just Christians and non-Christians. And not those who call themselves Christians, but those who are. They have the Spirit. And so let's look at more in another video, okay? God bless you. Look for your comments below so we can learn from one another. So what is the Spirit saying to you? Okay, put that down below in the comments. Okay.